This morning, we're going to be looking at a um, very familiar passage of Scripture that uh, we've heard numerous times, but um, I think it, it bears repeating, particularly uh, because of what we saw last week. Remember how Satan is at work in the world to try to deceive the world, and even in the church, to deceive Christians, to keep our minds off of what it is we should be looking at and keep us from doing what it is we ought to be doing, to keep the world happy in their unbelief so that the work of the kingdom actually doesn't uh, move forward. Uh, we saw the particular uh, philosophy that Satan has inspired in the current generation, uh, postmodernism, and what its tenets are, and Ravi Zacharias or Ravi uh, telling us, um, uh, giving us an example, uh, ammunition on how we might uh, actually deal with that particular error. Uh, what we want to do is kind of put this all together uh, be between this morning and this evening and see how we might use similar approaches to help people find their way out of the errors in which um, they're involved uh, with the ultimate purpose, again, of um, uh, gaining a hearing for the gospel because the gospel, remember, is what saves, not, not apologetics. So let's begin by reading 1 Peter 3, uh, verses 8 through 17. We are going to focus on verse 15 so that we understand that this is what the Lord calls us to do as a part of the Great Commission, that we need to be ready to give a defense for the hope that we have. And that hope, of course, is the faith. It is the, the, the gospel once for all delivered to the saints. So let's begin in uh, verse 8, and I'd like to read through verse 17. Uh, Peter writes this, To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation. And do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, Peter wrote uh, this first letter to uh, believers who were scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, which interestingly enough is what is today modern-day uh, Turkey. Uh, I say interesting because we, we know someone who's working in Turkey to uh, try to reestablish the, the churches, the seven churches of Asia Minor uh, that we read about in, in the book of Revelation, uh, the, the Bojacks. And we, we should uh, remember them in, in our prayers that the Lord would continue to bless them and keep them safe from that persecution. But Peter was writing to the believers who were there at that time to encourage them in their sufferings for the sake of the gospel. Uh, though it was coming from the hand of the Romans, uh, this was likely the beginning of the persecution that Nero instituted while he was Caesar in uh, 64 AD, Peter reminds his hearers that this test really came from the Lord and was ultimately meant for their good, to purify and to strengthen their faith. And again, just as a reminder, we know the Lord often tests our faith by bringing things into our lives that we need to face 
so that he might strengthen us, and of course in those areas that we're weak, that we might grow up. Remember, we've been looking at the fact that we need to grow up. The Lord wants us to grow up, to mature, to become more like the Lord Jesus. Now, Peter in this letter points to Jesus as an example of how they should suffer with patient endurance because, again, this is from the hand of God for their good. But he also points to Jesus as an example of how their suffering shouldn't stop them from sharing the gospel with with others, but how they ought to use the, the witness or the testimony that these sufferings actually bring to draw more attention to the power of the gospel. And I think that's what Peter has in mind in uh, verses 14 and 15, and particularly verse 15, which is our text, where again he writes this, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And I think Peter has in mind here as they see you are suffering patiently and enduring this, they're going to ask questions. Why are you doing this? You know, why are you willing to suffer for this man you say was raised from the dead. Well, that gives you the opportunity to make a defense for the hope that you have, uh, for the truth of the gospel. Why do you believe these things are true and why are you willing to give so much for them? Well, today I want us to consider between this morning and this evening five different things, four of which come from our text and actually if you look at verse 8, the fifth one is there as well. Uh, three of which we're going to look at this morning and two of which we're going to look at this evening. And the five things are these. What it is the Lord is actually calling us to do here, which is defend the faith, defend the gospel. Uh, why he wants us to defend the gospel. The different ways that his people have historically defended this or done this work. Uh, how we can defend the gospel today and perhaps even more strongly how we should do it. And then fifthly, the most powerful defense that we can make. So we're going to look, as I've said, at the first three of these this morning, and we'll look at the last two uh, this evening. So first of all, let's consider what the Lord is actually calling us to do here. Uh, what he's calling us to do is in verse 15. And again, let me just read it have it before us so that we can see what it is. I'm going to break it down piece by piece, and maybe you can just leave this text up while I'm doing this. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. First of all, Peter tells us that we are to sanctify Christ as Lord, by which, of course, he doesn't mean that we are to make Jesus more holy than he is because Jesus is already absolutely holy, but rather that we are to treat him as holy in our lives and before others. We are to set him apart as the one we respect, as the one we listen to, as the one we submit to because he is our Lord, and we are to show other people that we are willing to treat him that same way, and ultimately, of course, that's what Peter has in mind. That's what the Christians are doing as they are suffering for the sake of the gospel. They are sanctifying Jesus, setting him apart as that which is most important, as the one they treat as holy. Now, Peter says we are to do this from our hearts, not to be hypocrites, and a hypocrite, remember, essentially means somebody who's just acting the part or a good actor, pretending to respect him, keeping up appearances for whatever purposes we might have, maybe to convince uh, people in the congregation that we're a part of that we're genuine, maybe to convince the people out there that we're genuine. It's not going to work because when persecution comes along, as Jesus reminds us in the parable of the seed sower, uh, we're going to wither and we're going to fall away because we don't have depth of root. We're not rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to do this from the heart. We need to have a true and genuine respect for our Lord that grows out of love, that grows out of affection because we love Him. We're committed to Him. And out of this respect for Him and this love, we are to be prepared. 
to be ready at all times, Peter says, to give a defense. Now, what this word means, is it's actually from the Greek word apologia, from which we get the word apologetic. We are to give an apologetic, a defense, a reason, an argument for the hope that we have. And of course, that hope is the hope of salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, which comes through the gospel. And we are to be ready and willing to give it to everyone who asks us. Now again, we don't want to just simply live in such a way that we're waiting for people to come up and ask us all the time to, uh, you know, why it is we're doing what we're, we're doing. Uh, we, we do want to be more proactive, as it were, and we want to share the gospel with people. But we need to be living in such a way that people notice there's, there's a difference who see us serving other people. That's not very common today, to serve others. Maybe people who hear us sharing our faith with other people, or as it is in Peter's, uh, with Peter's audience, who see us patiently enduring the sufferings that we are going through for the things that we believe. You see, all these things can draw attention to the gospel, and people might ask us if they see us living differently. But of course, if we blend in with everybody around us, and we, we're really no different, we're speaking the same way, living the same way. Well, if we're doing that, we're not really obeying the Lord Jesus to begin with. But if we're doing that, no one's going to ask us because we're just one of, the, one of the group, one of the crowd. We need to live differently. We need to be salt and light. We need to be attracting attention, sometimes attention we don't necessarily enjoy, but attention to Christ. Let your good works shine before men in such a way that they may see them and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So we're to be ready to do this for everyone who asks us. We are to do it with humility as those who are servants and who are willing to suffer for the one who suffered for us. And he says we are to do it, what does he say here in verse 15? Because the word I had here was a little bit different. To do it with gentleness and reverence, which essentially means humility and fear. And the fear, of course, perhaps is the respect we have for the Lord that we're, we fear him enough to do this. Remember what Jesus said, don't be afraid of man who can kill the body, but be afraid of the one who after he has destroyed the body can destroy the soul in hell. Fear God and then you won't fear man. So he could have that in mind, but it could also be the fear of what might happen to our audience if we don't fear the Lord enough to share the faith with them. Uh, because if we don't, they're not going to be saved. Uh, they're going to go down into hell and they're going to suffer for eternity. There should be a certain fear of that, of course, taking place with them. So the desire to see them come to faith and to know that there is a very real threat. The threat is really not God. He's not the threat. The threat are their sins, the guilt that is attached to them, and the fact that God must punish sin because He is a just God. We wouldn't want God to be any other way than just, I think, because if He weren't, there would be no hope for any of us here at all. And we would have no hope that if we arrive in heaven, that he's not going to throw us out of heaven in the end. It's only God's justice, of course, the fact that he is going to do what is right at all times that guarantees our salvation. So the same thing that threatens the unbeliever is the same thing that guarantees our salvation because God has given us his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is our call to defend the faith. Now, secondly, why does the Lord call us to do this. Well, there's many reasons, but one of them we saw last week, and that is because of what Satan is doing to undermine God's truth in the world. He's essentially doing everything that he can to do this. Remember what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 4, verses 3 through 4. He says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel uh, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So the God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving, and he does that not just directly, but he does it indirectly through the various ideas that he sows within society, within culture. The different lies, remember, Satan is a liar, he is a deceiver, and that is his primary tool or weapon. He's continually introducing ideas, uh, 
systems of thought that seem reasonable, seem plausible, to give the world an excuse not to believe what God says in his word, to undermine his gospel. Now, Satan argues against the truth. The Lord wants us to argue for the truth. Now, Paul also told us in Romans chapter 1 that um, there, there's something else working against us, and that is the sin and the rebellion that is in the hearts of unbeliever that, unbelievers that move them to do exactly the same thing the devil does. Maybe you've heard me say on more than one occasion, and this is something Jonathan Edwards pointed out, and that is that unbelievers have the same nature as the devil, and the only reason why they appear to be different is because the Lord is restraining the unbeliever's sin more than he restrains the sin of the devil, but they do exactly, because of that sin in their hearts, they do exactly the same thing that the devil does, and that is uh, they try to cover over, they try to suppress the truth uh, in, in their unrighteousness. They try to hide it through their intellectual systems, what they see of God, so that they can quiet their consciences, so that ultimately they can live with themselves. They want to be able to live in this world, do what they want to do, and not suffer for it, so they hide the knowledge of God. Well, apologetics, or defending the truth, is one of the ways we can pull down the defenses that they build up, or pull down the, uh, you know, the, the, the systems that the, the devil actually erects in this world to bring unbelievers face to face with God. Now again, we've already asked this question, will apologetics, will argumentation save other people? No, but that's not what it's meant to do. It's really meant to give proof or to give evidence that what the Bible says is true. It's, it's meant to leave them with, without excuse, to, to answer, as it were, their excuses or their arguments against the reality of God and the truth of his word. It's meant to make <clears throat> people stop and think, kind of shake them loose from their position <clears throat> long enough that they might listen to the gospel that alone can actually save them. You know, in a certain way, uh, apologetics are like miracles because that's what miracles are, apologetics. They're defenses of the truth. Miracles also could not save anyone. Many Jews saw what Jesus did. And they still did not believe. Remember on one occasion, the Pharisees were watching him cast a demon out of a demon-possessed man. And they turned on him and said, you do that because you're in league with Satan. So they saw the miracle. It didn't convert them. Miracles really can't convert. But Jesus still did the miracles. And he gave his apostles the ability to do these miracles because miracles had a specific purpose. And that was to stop traffic and to get people to let go of their worldview long enough to pay attention to the worldview that Jesus was actually communicating to them through the gospel to get them to listen so that they might be saved. Now, apologetics can also help us. Uh, it, it can help us, of course, <clears throat> have what we need to get people to pay attention. But it can help us more personally. Sometimes the devil's arguments against the word of God and against the gospel and sometimes his, uh, well, I should say the, the sin that is inside of us can actually succeed in getting us to doubt, to doubt the truth of scripture. It's continually working against us as the enemy also is in this world to get us to reject the Bible. Sometimes he succeeds to a certain level. Now when that happens, and, and I imagine that all of us have experienced this at one point or another, apologetics or, or these kinds of arguments can actually help us to step back and look again at the evidence and realize it can't be any other way and to renew our faith. It, it, I know it's helped me in that way on more than one occasion in the past. Sometimes the devil can, like you say, you can come on very strongly and maybe you'll be tempted to doubt, but just step back and look at the evidence and you say, you know what, it cannot be any other way. One of the biology professors at the college that Don and I attended, who went on to help Ken Ham establish Answers in Genesis uh, in 1994, his name was uh, Gary Parker. He said that before evolutionary theory, all that was needed to cure anyone's atheism was simply to go outside <laughs> 
and take a look around and to look at something as simple as a blade of grass and to realize that that blade of grass, even that blade of grass, could not be there if God did not exist. And they didn't know nearly as much about that blade of grass as we know today. As we look into the cell and we see a whole universe of things going on in these microscopic cells, again, that's just one of the apologetics. But they didn't even have that. They just saw the life and they knew that life could not be there if God didn't exist. Sometimes we need to step outside and we need to look around and remind ourselves that these things could not be here if God did not exist. Now, so that's, okay, this is the call then. We are to defend the faith. This is the reason why is because Satan and the, inter the sin that's inside of us is working against us, working against unbelievers. Uh, now we come to the third point, which will take up the remainder of the time we have this morning. And that is the different ways in which the, the, the gospel has been defended historically. Now, apologetics can be as simple as sharing your testimony. I mean, it's, it's giving a defense, it's, it's giving evidence, it's giving an argument. Sometimes that argument can be just as simple as the evidence of a changed life. Sometimes that can be very convincing. You know, you were this kind of person and the Lord has changed you and made you this kind of person and the people who, who see you can't believe it's the same person, Right? And so that's a testimony, that's evidence, and that can be simple. We should always be willing to tell others what the Lord has done for us. That's, that can be a very powerful argument. So it can be very simple, but it can also be very complicated. There are several approaches that have been developed over the years uh, to defend the faith, and the most popular are basically these three, and I just kind of wanted to give us an overview of these three and, and how, how they've been used, okay? So the three are evidentialism, classical apologetics, and presuppositional apologetics. And again, they're high and lofty names, but they're not, they're not too terribly complicated when you get into them, but they're more complicated than just saying, I know that he lives because he lives within my heart, okay? That's going to have some evidential power, but not as much perhaps as other things might have, it depends. So first of all, evidentialism, what is it? Well, it, it's really what it sounds like. It's an argument from evidence, showing people who don't believe the many ways that the Bible actually shows itself to be God's word. Josh McDowell, as you may have heard that name, it's, it's kind of far in the past now, but those of us who are older still remember him, is famous for having written two books on this subject, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And then more evidence that demands a verdict. And I think they've been renamed uh, uh, nowadays, so it's not quite the same. But he offers evidence. Why do we believe the Bible to be the Word of God? And, of course, if you can prove the Bible is the Word of God and the Word of God says that God exists, you can also prove that at the same time. But, of course, just the fact that the Bible exists is evidence that God is real. The evidence really is very compelling that these things are true. I mean, that, let me just give you a couple of examples, that the Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years by over 40 different authors who came from many different walks of life, but oddly enough, not, not we oddly enough perhaps for the world, spoke with complete agreement on the very subject that people tend most to disagree on shows the hand of a single author, I would say. I mean, have you ever found anybody in your life that agrees with you on every single point of religion that you believe? And yet all these men agreed on, on all those things, even though they wrote over this period of time, and, they, and like I said, came from so many walks of life, they spoke with complete agreement on the most controversial subject there is in the world. Shows the hand of a single author. That it's been transmitted to us from its completion in the first century all the way to the present with amazing accuracy shows us that somebody is interested in maintaining the integrity of this, of this book. Shows the hand of one who is preserving it. That everything it records regarding the people and the places and the dates and so forth uh, that, that they, they say happen has actually been uh, authenticated, it's been proven in archaeology. 
it shows that it is reliable. And certainly we would expect that God's going to tell us the truth, that this is God's word. Now, what's particularly compelling, I think you would agree with me, are the hundreds of prophecies that have been fulfilled in Scripture that were given hundreds of years, thousands of years before they actually took place. Some have counted as many as 400 that Jesus fulfilled in his life and his ministry alone. And I think you need to understand many of which that even if he had, well, of course, he did know them, but even knowing them could not have had any control over them unless he was, in fact, the Messiah, the Son of God, such as when he would be born. You know, there was a prophecy that actually specified when Jesus was going to arrive and begin his ministry. Uh, Where he would be born, did Jesus have control over that, or could he as a mere man? What family he was actually born into? What would happen to the children that were also in that area in which he was born? How he would die? With whom he would die? Those are things, again, that if he were not the Messiah, the Son of God, he would have no control over, but they were done to him to fulfill prophecy. Now, there's many other ways in which the Bible shows itself to be the Word of God, and perhaps a good summary of it would be what we read in Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, verse 5, because I believe this incorporates everything we've seen so far. This is what we read. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture and the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, and the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation the many other incomparable excellencies and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself to be the Word of God. So it's interesting, isn't it, that in in the Scripture itself, it provides its own defense. It, It argues itself. But we need to know what those things are so that we can point them out to other people. So it's self authenticating, isn't it? The Bible proves itself. Now, the second approach is classical apologetics, and that's what we might call a more rational defense, and this is where things get perhaps a little bit more difficult to understand. But a rational defense in the sense that it sets out to show that God exists and the Bible is his word by reasoning from what we see in the creation uh, to, well, basically from what we see in the creation and in the Bible. Now, we call these rational arguments because they require a little bit of intellectual ability and they require some measure of logic, that which, again, postmodernism denies, but they can't really deny without assuming that those principles are actually true because otherwise what they're saying makes no sense at all. We're going to look at that a little bit more this evening. But let me give you a couple of examples. The first one is called the ontological argument, which is the argument from being or necessary being that something must exist eternally. And that, of course, is God. I think it's one of the most powerful arguments because it argues this way. Something exists now. I think we understand that something exists. We, we look around and even if we doubt our sense perception, which we never do, as we might say, when we're crossing the street or when we're driving our cars, we don't doubt our sense perception. We rely on sense perception, but if we doubt that these things around us actually exist, there's one thing that Rene Descartes pointed out that we could really never doubt, and that is the fact that there is somebody who exists exists now that is doubting. The doubter exists, okay? That means that at least something exists. Now, if something exists now, that means that something must have always existed because something cannot come from nothing. Although, again, you know, uh, I think Stephen Hawking, he knows the truth now, but I think during his life he said something can come from nothing. There was nothing, and then there was some sort of a a fluctuation in nothingness, and, and this whole universe just leapt into being. Okay? Well, do you believe that? Can you believe that? Out of nothing, nothing comes. That was a saying from of old because it was obvious to uh, the ancient philosophers, but not quite so obvious today. 
Now, this something that must be eternally has to be something other than what we actually see now, other than the creation, other than us, because we know that both the creation and we haven't always existed. I mean, that's one thing I think we agree with, on, with, with the evolutionists, is that there was a time when the universe didn't exist, or if we can say there was a time, at least some kind of a situation in which it, it didn't. The things that we see also cannot explain themselves. We look for an explanation. The only thing that can explain what we see is something that is eternal. And as we go into this argument even more deeply, we find that that something must be the personal God that is described for us in the Bible, and it cannot be otherwise. Another compelling argument is the cosmological argument, or basically that, that argument from cause and effect. For every effect, there must be something that causes it. You know, if you have like a pain in your, on your face, you know, and, and somebody just slapped you, well then, you know, you put two and two together. I have this effect, this pain. It must have come from that cause, that slapping in the face. Now what it does is it argues from what we see back to what it is that brought about what we see. Asking the question why. Well, what caused this? Why does this exist? And why does this exist? And so forth. Until you eventually go back to the very first cause, which is God. And I think that that's what Paul is arguing. Actually, probably from both of these arguments in Romans 1.20 that we looked at earlier. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. The things that God made, the effects, okay, show not only that he exists, that he is the cause, but it also tells us something of what he is like. It tells us that he is eternal. Again, you can't have something coming out of nothing. If something exists now, something has always existed. They show that he is powerful because he is the cause of everything that we see. What kind of power does it take to create a universe? We see that he is wise because he made everything that he made to work together in the way that, he, that it works. And it's, it's amazing that it does, even on a cosmic level. Things are all working together. And, you know, he's, what he's made shows us much more. And natural theology is all about that. What does the creation actually show us about God's eternal power and his invisible attributes? And uh, you may have heard R.C. Sproul on more than one occasion say that some natural theologians gain more information about God. They learn more about God from studying the creation than most Christians do by reading their Bibles. So there's a lot of information there. And Paul already told us that is an argument that exists. And it proves conclusively no one has an excuse for not believing. Now, finally, there's what's called the presuppositional approach. And this argument recognizes something that we need to recognize if we are to really help anybody. Find, uh, find the truth, find, find uh, uh, the gospel. And what it does, it recognizes that everybody has basic beliefs. They have a core set of assumption or basically rules that they have accepted by which they interpret everything that they see. Now for postmodernism, it might be the rule that there are no rules. And again, that, that's, a that's a contradiction. Uh, or it may be evolution, evolutionary theory. Uh, you know, the evolutionary, I think I would call it the evolutionary hypothesis because the theory is something that is essentially next to being proven and there's really no evidence for evolution at all. And I realize evolutionists might balk at that and tear their clothes and pull hair from their head, whatever they might do, but, but that is the fact. I mean, that is the case. There is no evidence for it. We'll look a little bit more at that this evening. But anyway, they use that as their basic assumption. And not surprisingly, all their interpretations of, of reality are going to agree with their basic assumptions or their presuppositions because they are the rule. They are the standards. And these things have to agree. Everything they see have to agree with their standard. Now, if, if the things they saw didn't agree with their standard then they would change that standard. They would change their assumptions. They would change their presuppositions. Uh, 
to match what they do believe. So let me give you an example. If you believe in evolution, if that is your basic assumption of reality, everything evolved, then everything you see and try to understand about the world around you will have to agree with evolution. And oddly enough, it will end up agreeing with evolution because evolution is your basic commitment. You believe that's true, so everything must agree with that principle. When the evolutionary biologist goes looking for causes, he's going to find those causes in natural laws or principles and, and processes that have been going on and on. When the evolutionary geologist goes out and examines the age of the world and he finds some indicators that, that say the world is really old and he's going to find some temporal indicators that say the world is really young. But his view of evolution dictates that only the ones that show that it's really old could be right. This one must be wrong. So we'll get rid of this one and we'll embrace this one because in his view, the world must be old. Now, the presuppositional approach seeks to point out basically those assumptions and the fallacy and the inconsistency that those, those assumptions actually bring. And after pointing them out, and that's exactly what Ravi, Ravi Zacharias did in, with the postmodern view, and we'll re revisit that this evening to see it as an example of how to use this approach, he basically showed the absurdity of believing what it is they believed to get them to, to shake them up at least long enough to, and I'm not sure that he did this or showed us how to do this in that video, but you do this long enough to invite them instead into your worldview and you show them what, how these things are all consistent with the biblical worldview, basically to show them that is the only one that is consistent with what we see and know to be true. Now, this particular approach that I've just mentioned is, is one that Reformed theology generally takes today because, I think mainly because they believe it is the only one that appears to argue from the fact that God exists and that the Bible is his word at the beginning rather than leaving it up for grabs until the question has been settled through argumentation. Now, I, I don't know if you see the difference between those two things, but that can be very confusing. If you say, okay, let's, let's say God doesn't exist, and let's say the Bible isn't his word, let's just look at the facts and see where they lead us. Okay, that's one way of doing it. Or you can come up and say, God exists, and the Bible is his word, and this is why. Okay, that is the presuppositional approach. You... The assumption is there at the beginning that you're seeking to prove and you're not leaving the conclusion up to grabs. And I think we don't really want to leave it up for grabs. We don't want to say your conclusion could be right, my conclusion could be right, let's just go ahead and argue because that really, I don't think, would, would honor the Lord as, as much. Now, again, I'm, I'm not sure that anybody really does that, you know, uh, that leaves it up for grabs ultimately. But there are some who argue that they do and so that wouldn't be the right thing to do. Now, let me just mention this in, in closing. John Frame, who was the former professor of theology and apologetics at Westminster, California, he's a person who, instead of driving wedges between people, okay, you're classical, you're evidential, you're presuppositional, you guys, you can leave. And presuppositionalists, you can stay. You're the ones that are right. You're the only ones that are right. And we're going to argue against you guys until you finally see the light. Instead of taking that kind of approach, he would basically say, you know what, you guys are all really saying the same thing, and let me show you why. And he would try to bring them all together. Now, some have criticized him for doing that, but that is one thing that I liked about John Frame when it came to certain, certain issues, I, I think really all the issues. He was trying to honor the Lord by showing similarity rather than difference. And, and even going beyond that to show that we were all really doing the same thing. Now, John Frame believed that even if you're doing evidential apologetics, even when you're doing classical apologetics, we're really all starting with the pre, same presuppositions. Even if you don't want to say you believe in God and His Word, you are assuming those things to be true in your arguments, so that is, in fact, what you're doing. And you are. Because if God didn't exist there would be no laws of logic. If God didn't exist, there would be no Bible. 
and you are arguing for his existence and for this Bible as his word because you believe that to be true. So those things have to be true for your arguments actually to go in the right direction and to prove what it is they're trying to prove. And you already believe that, and that is what you're seeking to prove. And so John Frame would say we're all presuppositionalists if we're Christians. As we're arguing for the truth of Scripture, it's just that we've included, you know, we're, we're starting somewhere else in the argument process uh, than where we might think we're actually beginning. So again, we have these three different approaches, actually four, and we're going to see a fifth one this evening, which is, you know, the evidence of a changed life, which is really the same as the fifth one, I think. Showing the evidence that the Bible shows itself to be the Word of God. Uh, pointing people to the evidence that, that God gives us in creation that already gets through and already leaves everybody without excuse. You just kind of sharpen the arrow a little bit more and kind of send it with a little bit more force, maybe. I don't know. And then the presuppositional argument, which basically says, you know what, there, there is no sense there is no argumentation, there is no rationality, there's no existence, there's no nothing. Unless God actually does exist, then the fact that you even can be, exist and have your position and even argue for it already proves that God exists because you wouldn't even be able to do that if God didn't exist. So, these different methods. What I want us to do this evening is basically just look at two examples of how to apply this approach. I want us to revisit what Ravi Zacharias did as he, as he applied the, you know, the argumentation to postmodernism. And secondly, how we can apply this to the evolutionary worldview, because I think that's the one we're going to run into more than any other in, in this particular uh, culture at this particular time. And then we're going to conclude by considering what Jesus calls the most powerful apologetic, that most powerful defense that we can give the world of the Christian faith which really is the power uh, or the, the argument of a changed life, a supernatural love. So may the Lord at least use some of the things we've seen this morning to strengthen our faith. If you follow along with some of these arguments, then perhaps it's confirmed again in your own mind and heart that these things are true, that God is real. The Word is, you know, the Bible is His Word, and, you know, if you happen to be doubting or... Uh, struggling, maybe it's helped to strengthen you, but also to strengthen us in the sense of giving us the resources that we need to be able to argue for the truth of His Word, if the Lord gives us the opportunity that we might gain a hearing for the gospel from somebody who otherwise might not even listen to us. Again, remember apologetics is just pre-evangelism, getting rid of some of the roadblocks that might keep somebody from hearing. I don't want to listen. Well, what do you believe? And you deal with them and then you, you point them to yours and show the consistency. Hey, that may open them up to listen to the gospel, which is what we need, you know, what we're seeking uh, to bring them. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's ask the Lord to, to help us in this area, remembering that this is what our Lord is, is actually calling us to do.